Well, I first saw a photo of Lane Jones uh, hanging off a ladder, I think, <laughs> uh, next to a, a big tall lighthouse, uh, uh, written up in all the media, and you know, apparently, and so she uh, single-handedly, uh, you get the impression, but I'm sure with a great team, put together uh, the Burnt Island Lighthouse in the middle of uh, the bay in Booth Bay Harbor. And, and that was just her biggest exploit, maybe, or most public. Uh, <laughs> And she has been the uh, education director for the Department of Marine in, uh, Resources, specializing in uh, letting the world and especially schools uh, know about the, uh, the value of lighthouses in Maine culture and what it takes to keep them whole. So um, that's a lot of what she's going to talk about tonight uh, and more beside how to help us out with our own lighthouse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, uh, inviting me, Alan, and uh, for being here. And I do have to tell you, I have been in Prospect Harbor before, twice actually. No, three times. Um, but two of them had to do with the sardine factory, because as the education director, I needed to know what the fisheries were in the state of Maine in order to be able to, um, you know, educate the public, as well as I was responsible for the Maine State Aquarium for building that facility in Booth Bay Harbor. So that was my first baby, or my first endeavor. And then um, in 1998, um, there was a program called the Maine Lights Program, and it was a transfer of 28 lighthouses to new owners. And there was a, a hierarchy, a kind of a, an order where other government agencies, federal government, had top priority. Then it was state government. Then it was municipalities. Then it was nonprofits. And I fell in as the education director for Department of Marine Resources as a state agency. So at least I was pretty high up on that ladder. And I looked at Burn Island. I went out there um, because I needed a place for teachers. I was doing courses in the summertime. And I could never find reasonable housing for them in Booth Bay Harbor. And all of a sudden, one night, I had three little kids, and why, I, you know, fate, I guess, I was watching the news that night, and they announced this Maine Lights program. So man, I got on of that right quick, and found out what's available, and found one was only a mile away from the Booth Bay Lab in the aquarium. So uh, the rest is history on that. But Alan asked me to be here tonight to talk to you, and I guess just kind of brainstorm with you here at first about your lighthouse, um, because you're in a really kind of a odd situation with it being on a Navy base right now, a uh, naval base, and soon to be, what, Space Force um, taking over. So let's kind of, I don't know, if, how many of you have seen this picture before of the first Prospect Harbor Light? Okay. So it was built, as you can see on the slide, in 1850. Um, I guess at that time, there was some fishing action and some coastal uh, trade going on in this region, and so they decided they would build a lighthouse here. And the early lighthouses like this, a lot of them were of rubble stone. They, were, they would go to a site and they would utilize the building materials from that site harvest the granite or whatever and build those first lighthouses. And many of them were attached like this too, where the tower was directly attached to the keeper's dwelling. Um, so 1850 was its first time that the light was shown, um, but it was deactivated in 1859 to 1870. How many of you knew that, that that light was extinguished? Just a couple of you, okay. Do you know why? Does anybody know why that was extinguished? Huh? Bureaucracy. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, the U.S. Lighthouse Board was responsible for lighthouses at that time. And what they decided was Prospect Harbor wasn't a really good harbor for shelter. Many of the times, lighthouses helped to lead ships or vessels into a protected harbor. And Booth Bay Harbor was one of the best in mid-coast Maine uh, for harborage. Uh, so they decided we're going to extinguish the light and they did that for some 11 years. And then finally they decided, okay, it's time. 
let's relight this. There's more activity going on, more fishing. Uh, and then we ended up, this, this lighthouse was still used for a number of years until 1891, and then they built the present day lighthouse that you have now. Um, note in this picture, there's a covered walkway between the tower and the house. And this photograph itself um, is from the Coast Guard's records. I've done a lot of historic research, not only on Burnt Island, but all of Maine's lights, uh, because I started a nonprofit called Lighthouse Education and Nautical Studies, which has the acronym of LENS. So um, I, I kind of smartened up after this transfer of lighthouses took place. I said, gee, if I had a nonprofit, you know, I'd be able to get a lighthouse and I wouldn't have to work for state government. Um, and, but then what happened, I decided, well, I better stick this out and get a retirement because nothing is certain if I tried this on my own. However, now in retirement, um, I am doing lots of programs um, such as this and working with teachers, uh, working with local kids who are doing a summer camp on Bird Island. So I'm still into lighthouses. But I got this record here from the uh, Civil Engineering Unit in Providence, Rhode Island. So if anybody is looking for historic research, um, you can ask me, I've been everywhere. Uh, National Archives in Waltham, National Archives in DC, National Archives in College Park, Coast Guard Historian in DC. Um, I've been to every repository I could go to try to gain information, first about Burn Island, but then I continue to do other lighthouses too. So let's move on. And um, just a couple of quick facts. Um, your lighthouse, of course, is made of wood now. I think you probably all know that and not stone. Um, it was automated in 34, but it wasn't, it was unmanned un, and it stayed until 1953, the last keeper left the lighthouse. Uh, it was placed on the National Historic Register uh, in 1988. And then, unfortunately, this happened to you. Um, on June 27th, last year, um, I did take a drive before I got here today to see about condition and how things were progressing and if they were. Um, to see that it looks like the roof is at least closed, everything is closed in. Uh, does anybody know about the degree of restoration that's taken place or anybody can report on that? They don't let you in. You don't know much. Okay. It's delayed. It's, it's delayed? Okay, at least it's watertight, okay, and that's what's important. And I understand from reading in the, a newspaper article that um, the fire was contained mostly to the second floor, that the first floor didn't receive as extensive damage, and so hoping that that's true. And I'm, I would assume that they're working with the State Historic Preservation Commission, or we call the person in charge, the SHPO, uh, State Historic Preservation Officer, and that's Kirk Moni is his name, um, because anything, when you have a historic site, you got to do it according to standards. So I'm sure that's happening. I hope. Okay, present situation as I know it. When Alan said, we really don't know what's going on, I contacted Bob Trapani. Bob Trapani is the president of the American Lighthouse Foundation. He's also a civilian employee for the Coast Guard. So he goes and maintains all the lights along the coast of Maine, probably from Rockland all the way down east. Um, he told me, as you can see on the list here, um, that the Prospect Harbor Light is owned by the Coast Guard. It was once leased to his organization until 2017. And he said their improvements that they made were basically to the lantern room, the whole lantern on the top of the lighthouse, uh, to that into the deck that went around it. He says the Navy uses the lighthouse as a property, as a morale facility. So for other Navy uh, families or Navy officers or whoever, um, it's a place for them to come and they utilize the building um, for that. The Navy base that it sits on was completed in 1965, and it has, uh, as you know, I'm sure, two small radomes there, uh, used by personnel to control and monitor worldwide satellite systems. So um, I guess that is the reason it's being turned over to the Space Force. Um, 
and that's currently in a transition process and Bob said it should it, it was scheduled to be done this fall but again whether or not that happens we all know about the rate of things getting done in government so, um, it is a high security and he did mention to me even as the organization of ALF um, it was not always easy to get in there and get by the security to do the work that they wanted to do, but it is on a six acre site. So I went on Google Earth to show you what it looks like from above. Um, and you folks are more familiar with this than I, um, but I did go, whoops, uh, let's see. I went to that gate right there today so that I could take a picture of the lighthouse right over here. Um, and I didn't go any further down this road or venture any place else, but it looks like the security gate is right here and then another one here and of course going down this way. And I assume there's one along the road, road there somewhere. Uh, has anybody ever been in there before? One, one person, or two, okay, maybe three, all right. Um, so it's like, how can you how can you skirt that gate? <laughs> Let's talk about this. <laughs> that shot. Yeah. Um, so can this light station be open to the public? Here are just a few questions I'm throwing out at you. How do we overcome this security restrictions? Will the Navy allow public access? Will the Coast Guard entertain a lease? And it all depends what you envision, what you want to do with that lighthouse. Does the group have a current affiliation with the government at all? It's always good as who you know, okay? That gets you a long way. Um, will a nonprofit be formed or are you considered as a nonprofit right now as the Historical Society? So I would assume you're looking under your umbrella uh, to hopefully utilize this lighthouse. And any anticipated sources of funding. Um, being a community that has a lot of summer folks, just like I was in Booth Bay Harbor, um, I was able to raise a half a million dollars for my restoration. And it started out, and I guess I'll wait and I'll show you when you get to my slides, um, the different steps that I took to try to fundraise. But, at least having some summer folks who go home and have other connections. And I'm not saying Prospect Harbor locals don't have connections, because you certainly do, and you also have passion for your place. It's always nice to be able to know where there's some pockets of money, because you're going to need it. But now, I just want to say, let's be creative. Anybody have any ideas in your mind as to how we can get by that gate and be able to utilize it. That's what, that's what came to mind for me immediately, by boat. Because if you look at, there's a gate right there. This peninsula is open right here. This looks pretty rocky, and I don't know, but just from this aerial <laughs> photograph. And it looks pretty rocky here, and I think you're to the open ocean, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. From that point. So, Where's the most sheltered spot? You know, I would think like here might be the most, I could be wrong and I don't know what the depth is like there, but is it possible to put a wharf in there? And then you can do a water taxi to that point. Anybody want to share? Piggyback on my thoughts? No, I don't think it's going to work. This Why? Because it's a Navy base and yeah. the security, they're not going to let you in there. Okay, but if you come from the water and there's a gate there? I don't there, care how you come. Yeah, they're not going to let you in there. You're famous. <laughs> okay, well, that's, I guess that's why I just want to tell you. just my opinion. Yes. Still gas connected with another Navy base. With that alpha, Navy Base Command now, there's no way they're going to let open access to the lighthouse. Right. Period. It's too close for security um, to the facility. And it's just, there's no way to police, particularly somebody showing up on a boat. We, we live in a world of terrorism now. You can yeah. walk in and throw in a, you know, a, a, a 
a satchel bomb over the fence, under the roof, or something like that. It just <clears throat> they got the minimal amount of space that they need to keep a bare minimum amount of security. Mm -hmm. They'd rather have more if they could. But yeah, they're, I don't think they'll ever let to the, <clears throat> the people who use the lighthouse you had to be a DOD employee or active duty military or retired give you a federal ID and to check that against the databases and everybody going in would have to sign in, sign out. Yeah, I, maybe you know, special events, you might be able to get permission to use it, but I don't think they'd ever let general touring like they do in most other lighthouses. Okay. Um, I did ask Bob Trapani that question because he does work for the Coast Guard and he said this is his response. And I said, can't we be creative here? And he says, I think creative is the way to always be. And even though this site is one of the toughest any of us will encounter due to the sensitive nature of it, one never knows. He said, I think the locals having potential options for the future is the way to go. So I guess we just talk about potential options. Yes? There is precedent for uh, an occasional tour with the fight, the cause of the fire. Yes? Yeah, would you define morale facility? <laughs> uh, having a good time and relaxing and trying to forget life. I don't know. Yes? Uh, I got two of you right in a row there. Go ahead first, gentlemen. The morale facility, as he described, was the Navy Special Programs Office was able to schedule for Yeah, it used to be. Yeah, but I'm wondering if it's the same as it was. Yeah. Yeah. If well, you after 9-11, after there was a grant to fortify yeah. the protection in the water. Do you remember that? There were bu uh, it was buoys and, I don't know, protective things yeah. on the sh yeah. shore to protect the shore. From sure. And the, the I'm sure there were more, it was more than that, but there was actually money that was loca uh, allocated specifically to shore up uh, and tighten the security. Security there. Did you have more to say? Yeah. If you look at a future option for the nonprofit, the Space Force may or may not have maintenance funds in the years to come. And if you had that endpoint reserve with the ability and the willingness to maintain the upkeep of the building, they may be able to negotiate some access at that time. Okay. That's an idea, yes. Yeah, the protective things that she's talking about, the reason they were put there, because Cesar Favalero knew the guy who was running at that time. He did it because he had to spend the money. That's well, all. There was no other reason for him going there. Okay, it was, this was like a, a, a donate, a don uh, was it government money or was oh, it? Yeah. Oh, it was government well, money. Government money is your money. Well, I know that, but um, I'm, I'm just saying versus a donation from a foundation yep. or something like yeah, that. He had to spend the money, so yeah. he spent them on these. <laughs> yeah, so I worked for state government for 30 years, and about um, four weeks before the end of the fiscal year, my boss would say, uh, you got $40,000, you need to spend it by tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I always had a list um, for purposes yeah. like that. Yes? Before 9-11, there used to be an annual open lighthouse day, mm -hmm. yeah. women's club would do tours. And I yeah. was able to get in on one before, after 9-11 yeah. they closed it all down, that's when they put up all the security access. And I don't feel optimistic about getting access because things have not improved since 9-11. Mm -hmm. We still have more terrorists in the world yeah. and uh, yeah, things just don't look good. So I don't, I don't see them just letting people in. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
I guess it's up to you guys to kind of brainstorm some more, just knowing the <laughs> government, you said you've contacted some government officials, Alan, um, you know, some senators and representatives. Yeah, yes, in order to uh, promote, uh, at least to stabilize it. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, we had some senators and also from the governor. Okay. Uh, I don't know what effect it had, but um, at that point, after that, Money came from the Navy to uh, stabilize the boat. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, is your office doing a formal feasibility study on this whole idea, or are you just? No, I'm just throwing out ideas. This is coming out of my head. Not, I'm not. I have nothing to do with state government anymore. I am retired. Um, so uh, I'm just. I mean, I've been through hoops and hurdles in order to restore Burn Island, and I'll show and share that with you um, in a minute. But um, I just wanted to start the program out by saying, I understand you've got a big hurdle here. Now, is can we be creative? Can we think of certain things? Um, lighthouses have been moved in the yes. past. Could yes. that be a possibility that it could be moved to another site? They're not utilizing it for their purposes. Well, they were for no, but morale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, um, as time has gone on, because again, I was in the same position, uh, the Coast Guard said to me, do you want us to extinguish your light? I mean, really, it's more of a nostalgic thing. Um, everybody has GPS and plotters mm -hmm. and ways to navigate most people. Um, have I had people come to Burn Island before lost in the fog? Yes, I have. Um, they heard the fog horn and it, they followed their ear, okay, until they got to me and said, we're lost. And so it has a value to it. Its position on that point being historic, but it's historic for a guiding reason too, to guide vessels safely in and out of the harbor. <coughs> so I don't... I don't know. Yes, lighthouses have usually moved, but they've kind of moved back off the shore um, in order for erosion that has taken place in a lot of other states that could jeopardize, you know, the longevity of the structure. So, um, how about boat trips? I mean, I know you said they were limited in how close they could get, but has anybody thought about, you know, little boat trips, tourist trips around, at least from the water, and then, as you said, maybe at least a few times a year. We just had Maine Open Lighthouse on last Saturday, um, and so with the, that, that is organized by the American Lighthouse Foundation, the Coast Guard, and the Maine Tourism Bureau. Those three organizations sponsor Maine Open Lighthouse Day, so maybe they'll at least open that once a year for internal? Yes. That was one of the days that they used to open it yeah. a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. The Women's Club and Prospect Harbor used to uh, guide people. Go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you all need to put your thinking caps on now when you leave here today and be in touch with these folks who kind of lead this organization and maybe you can come up with something um, and then need to start some talks, I guess, with the government, but it's going to be hard until Space Force gets there, solidifies themselves into that position, I would assume, but you might start with the Coast Guard, too. Yes? There's one other possibility. Um, I don't know if it still exists or not uh, in the Navy. <clears throat> in the 1990s, I owned a sailboat and I lived in Arizona, and I had a friend at the Toronto, the Navy Yacht Club on Toronto Island. And the Navy Yacht Club there was a naval preserve owned by the Navy on North Island um, where helicopters fly out, do seal training, whatever. But the Yacht Club itself was a naval preserve. So to make a long story short, I bought a sailboat. I kept it out there for $35 a month on my board. That's a good deal. <laughs> um, because I did not have to be in the Navy at the time. So the area was a Naval Preserve and not a Navy base. Okay. So the difference was in the Naval step around it is two fences instead of one. Mm -hmm. I think it's just going to be if what the historical society here wants to do. How do you want to educate the public? I mean, your best view of it, I think, is from the factory, um, I would assume, across. 
Um, but if it's just going to be a, a tour group or if it's going to be a boat trip with people on board, I, you know, I don't know the degree of tourism here versus Booth Bay Harbor. I can tell you there's plenty of it. Um, but um, again, that's something you guys are going to have to toss around amongst yourselves and see, you know, what's our objective? What's our educational objective? What's our maintenance objective? How can we help? Um, we have to have monetary, you know, objective to find help finance some of this because yeah the covid money is gone I, I think for the government now and so things are going to start to uh and i don't know about the federal government but i'll tell you the state government got plenty of covid money that uh, probably wouldn't, wasn't used to best use of it but that's my opinion okay <laughs> maybe that shouldn't be on the, on the tape <laughs> anyway um let's move on i'm going to move on to the burn island light anybody been in booth bay harbor before Oh, good number of you. Anybody seen the Bird Island Light before? All right. So this is the one closest to the entrance of Booth Bay Harbor, and it's actually the first lighthouse in the Booth Bay region. And then, of course, um, a claim to fame. Um, it is the oldest original lighthouse in the state of Maine. So it was the ninth station to be built in 1821. It lit up on November 9th, 1821. But Portland Head, you will all say, oh, that's the oldest lighthouse. Yes, it's the oldest station, that's correct. But Portland Head Lights Tower has gone up and down five times. <laughs> and when it was built, it wasn't in Maine. Wait, what was it in? Yes. Massachusetts. <laughs> so Maine became a state in 1820 and Burn Island was built the next year in 1821. It's a five acre island. Um, it's about a mile from uh, the harbor itself. Um, I did put in that float, so you can see the float system right there, um, and uh, the ramp that goes up onto the island. That's kind of the most sheltered area. Um, as you might know that most lighthouses have boat houses. The boat house and the boat slip is right there, okay, because it does have that nice cove, which is true, but the lee of the island there um, was a, is a, was historically there was a wharf there at one time, and so that's where I returned the access to making it a lot easier to get tour boats coming and going to drop people off. Um, this is what the keeper's dwelling looked like when I acquired it in 1998. Um, so it. You know, it was still pretty much intact, but it had been 10 years since the last keeper had left. That was 1988, uh, in October of that year. Uh, the light itself had 30 keepers over those number of years, from 1821 to 1888. And so it was still in decent shape. It wasn't leaking, but here are some of the problems that I had to encounter. <laughs> No, no septic, no water, no heat, a little bit of a leaking roof upstairs, asbestos in the basement, lead paint, uh, public access. Um, when this was turned over as part of the main lights program, there were covenants in that deed, and the Coast Guard said, you must allow public access. You must do education, recreation, preservation, and historic and historic restoration. So those five covenants in the deed um, kind of like sets the scene for what each of the lighthouses acquired at that time. And if you don't abide by those, they had the right to revoke the deed. So I had to meet historic standards, of course, and I put down mega bucks. Yeah, it costs a lot of money. And when you're on an island, you get the island factor to add to it. So um, planning, okay. So I had to make the assessment, okay. What period should we choose here? Um, when you're going to restore a site, you gotta have, be true to a certain period. So, and I'll show you why I chose the year that I did. Uh, did a lot of research, as I already mentioned that to you. I've been around and found as many pockets of information and photographs as I could. Said the island factor, I have a master plan, but you gotta have a plan B too. However, I did form an A team. Who's going to be as passionate about this lighthouse as I am? Um, I was a biology major. I had no interest in history at all. But it was acquiring this site that I could see all the educational opportunities, but I also knew what my responsibilities were. And then when I started finding pieces to my puzzle, 
I became a historian. I changed. Um, and so I'm very excited to continue that research and I do have to get a book written before I die because I probably know the most about Burn Island than anybody on earth and I owe it to Burn Island. So I formed an A-team. Who's going to help me? Who's going to be passionate with me? I befriended former keepers and I know you guys, it's been a long time since a keeper was there, but mine was 1988. So I still have seven of them alive. When I started, I had 14 of them alive and I interviewed them, did oral histories and I also found families, uh, the children who lived there. Many just won this past weekend. Uh, Steve, Steve McCullough was seven to 11 years of age when he lived there and boy, he can share some stories, I'll tell you. Finding volunteers. A lot of people will help. And as I saw more and more people come on to Bird Island, I say, okay, you've been here too many times. You need to come help. If you're going to come visit this island, you know, every week, uh, Mondays, we have all our gardeners come and uh, help with any of the uh, landscaping and, and just keeping the island looking good. Uh, had to find some money. And I did. And you have to always be resourceful um, in order to be able to juggle things if necessary. So under the persistence, um, enthusiasm is contagious. If you have enthusiasm, other people see it and they join. Um, my family was highly involved um, in the process, all of them, and my children even at a young age. Uh, try to maintain that positive attitude, we can do this, we will get there. Wrote a lot of grants, uh, met some generous people, um, always tell me it's a noble effort and uh, it's my legacy to know that I have left it in a better place than when I got it. Here's some of the research, as I mentioned, the Coast Guard, I've been to all those places, um, National Archives, I mentioned historic groups, local historic societies, as you said, you're going to be scanning pictures and documents, I'm sure there's going to be quite a few of the lighthouse in there. Finding those former keepers and getting records. Um, I did find a website called Fred's Place. That was great. Um, I just started posting. I'm looking for former Bird Island keepers. And some of them, and some of them who were relief keepers because Booth Bay had Damaris Cove Island, which was a, a life-saving station. And then they moved into, it became the Coast Guard out. There's another couple, three, four miles away. But then they came into town. And so I really did have um, quite a few people who would, who responded. Uh, lighthouse organizations. Again, we're all kind of on the same mission and everybody likes to share when they get materials. So here's some of my early pictures of Burn Island Light. This was a photograph taken in 19, 1859. Um, this actual building was built in 1858 and there was a whole series of photographs taken in 59. Um, so it was a board batten siding, a brown siding. You can see the long covered walkway there. Um, then a little workroom and the house, and of course that little white house is an outhouse out back. Mm -hmm. No plumbing. Here's changes that took place in 1888. So and, and it became a clabbered on the outside and um, a couple other little buildings, but notice as a five acre island, and it was called, it is called Burnt Island, and don't know this for sure, but um, there are 11 burnt islands in Maine. And um, one of the functions was they would bring sheep in the summertime to all coastal islands, and they would burn the islands in order to get a good grass, uh, crop grass to grow. The other thing is that fishermen used to go to islands and they would burn tar to tar their nets because People often burn their own homes down if they did it in their own yards. And so they figured, let's go to an island where there's nothing. So if we burn, it's okay. So don't know where this burnt came into place, but look at all the stone walls and the fencing. So I do know from reading the log books in the National Archives, which I haven't checked to see if Prospect Harbor lights, but it, they could be in Washington in the archives. And I've been able to read from 1868 to 1936 uh, down there. All the keepers put their entries in. So I know there were sheep, cows, pigs, chickens, and a pony out there. <laughs> so I finally found a set of negatives in the historic preservation, um, the civil engineering unit in Providence, Rhode Island, the Coast Guard. Um, I said, oh my gosh, negatives. Can I please take these home and, and print them? And so, because I was still looking for my period of time, what was I going to, um, you know, restore this to? And so amongst 
these photographs, look what I got, internal photographs. And the calendar on the wall said August 1950. So I said, okay. There were 11 photographs of inside of the house. So then, of course, what did I do? Who used to live there in 1950? And Joseph Muse, in the top right-hand side, the keeper there, moved in in 1936. The Coast Guard took over. He was part of the old U.S. Lighthouse Service. The Coast Guard took over in 1939 for lighthouses, and he was there till 51. Yeah. So 16 years of his life on Bird Island, and those children came with him. Well, except she was born in town. Anne was born in Booth Bay. Um, there were three there, and there were two others as well. And so um, Willard, luckily, Willard lived right in Booth Bay. So it was golden. I could always just drop in on Willard, and he would tell me anything I wanted to know. I even brought him paint chips. I said, pick out the gray, and he did. But what was really fun is we started a living history program, and I'll, I'll be covering that in a minute. And every year, the three daughters would return, and they would teach the children who were interpreting them about what life was like for them when they were children on the island. And so, of course, the girls, the interpreters, would say, you know, what was your favorite music? What was your favorite game? What did you do? And they'd always have questions ready for them because they needed to play those roles during the summer months. This is another shot of what the house looked like when I got it. A nice big deck. Yeah, those Coast Guard guys had a good time in the latter years, but what it did, it covered a treatment plant because it used to be pipe overboard discharge like most places on coastal properties there were. So no more overboard discharge in 1988. So look, had to bring in 200 yards of fill and put in a, sand, a filter system. You can see all the... Um, filters there, all the plastic chambers or whatever. And so we raised the elevation of that field there next to Burn Island quite a bit. So that was put in. Um, the Coast Guard had their submarine cable that brought electricity to the island, but of course they always put it in the most convenient place, which was on the beach. And where do you think people like to migrate to? The beach. And so we moved this cable to the back side of the island and put in a trench all the way through in order and ensleaved that cable as it entered into the water for about 100 feet because of abrasion. We also brought a water line 2,200 feet over from the nearest property because if you're going to have the public, you've got to have water. I mean, it's the easiest way. So we, we wrote a grant and we did get, um, it was a main outdoor heritage fund, um, which was scratch tickets. Um, and I did get $120,000 from them for those two projects of water and septic. So phase one restoration. Um, we just had enough money to do the inside. The outside we painted. Oh, we did put a roof on, on that at that time too. Uh, went back to a shingled roof. Now I had all those specifications and uh, according to the 1950s at that point. So we painted a lot of <laughs> like bubble gum and you know whatever we could do to patch up the holes and the clatterings and paint. And uh, so it looks pretty good from the outside. Um, but the inside is what we tackled first so that we could open it up as a museum and people could come in. So you can see the before and after pictures um, on the slide. And right there in the kitchen, of course, it was we needed some new windows, new floors, new cabinets, a cook stove, antique furnishings, a pantry had to be rebuilt. The bathtub is in there back there because they didn't have any bathroom in Bird Island until 1952. Um, shelving and old cookware was uh, accumulated. A lot of donations on that, and I bet you some of you folks here have some old cottages that people would do the same. Um, the kitchen on the other side, we put beadboard cabinets, an enamel sink, uh, a linoleum countertop, and we put a hand pump. Never got that hooked up. I visited a guy one time to say, how can I make this hand pump do the job? And he had uh, put what a, um, you know, a regular faucet where you go right, left, you know, every way to get your water. And he mounted it underneath and he had um, a pole that went down through the middle of the pump. And so he could make that whole head of the pump turn. And that's how he got his hot and cold water. And I said, 
wonderful. I said, but I never got my husband to, uh, to get that hooked up. But we did hardwire in the lamps, so they look like a candle, you know, like a, like a, a kerosene lamp. Um, old canisters, and we put some nice uh, Douglas fir floors in. Here's the dining room, um, before and after. We did have the whole chimney and the um, fireplace rebuilt at that point. And the covered walkway museum, it's a 40 foot passageway, so it's quite long, so that became the museum with all the historic photographs on the left hand side and the wall of keepers on the right hand side. So I was able to get photographs of many of the keepers and um, wrote up a little, some information of whatever I could gather from um, live and the families of those deceased. A nonprofit, as being part of state government, you just can't always raise money. People say, I pay my taxes, I don't need to give you any money, you should get money from the department. Well, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And so the Keepers of Burn Island Light was formed, a local group of very uh, interested and talented folks. So here are some of the board of directors helping out with some of the maintenance uh, on scraping and painting inside and out. But this is what Alan was probably uh, interested in. How did I get the money? Where did you get your money? So my first um, fundraising event was an auction at the Spruce Point Inn, which was across, right across the way from Burn Island. So it's highly, highly seen by all of the visitors <coughs> there to that resort. Um, 28 artists, headed by Don Demers, um, a summer artist, participated in two weekends. They came out on a bird island and they, paint, they were allowed to paint, but they had to donate two complete paintings that were all framed and ready for auction. So I ended up with you know almost 60 paintings that were put up for auction. With that one night, I brought in $33,000. So, and I still had some that didn't sell, so we, we raffled those off to continue to make money. Um, evening socials, when you're in a, a town like Booth Bay, a lot of people like to get together in the evening, and so we did a few of them. So um, Mark and, and Buzz uh, allowed their inn, which looks right down onto Booth Bay Harbor, which is beautiful. I went to a, a craft brewery, and I said, can you make a Burnt Island light beer? <laughs> I was like, come on, we got to have something here. Um, and he's like... I will make a beer, but I will not call it Burnt Island Light Beer. I make, I make IPAs. I don't like light beer. I said, okay. So he called it 10 Lewis Ale. And if any of you are familiar with the lighthouse history, the first lamps that lit the lighthouse were Lewis lamps. And so there were 10 of them that were in Burnt Island's lantern room. So I said, all right, 10 Lewis Ale is its name. Um, Fisherman's Wharf, a big hotel there, did a benefit dinner. Um, Hendricks Head is a private lighthouse. Um, it, in the 1930s, a lot of lighthouses were sold because the government said, we don't need to maintain all these lights anymore. And the Hendricks Head was one of them that went on the auction block. And it's owned by Ben and Luann Russell. Um, many of you might have, been, they're, they're from Alabama. Uh, Russell Athletic Corporation. You ever wear those Russell sweatshirts and sweatpants? Okay, that's his grandfather that started the business. So they allowed us, and, and by the way, the Coast Guard later came back, just like Prospect Harbor, and said, what happened is we need to relight that light, okay? And so it stays on private property, but it is maintained by the Coast Guard. So the light is functional once again. So again, nobody gets to go visit Hendricks Head Lighthouse because it's a private home. So getting to befriend the Russells, I said, hey, what do you think we do at evening social and that will benefit Burn Island? And they said, great, that would be fine. Uh, the best thing that happened to me that night was a gentleman who had purchased a couple of the paintings from the auction came up to me and he goes, I want to help you with Burn Island Light. And I said, you do? <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then when he said, my children have nothing to want for, I started crying. I was like, oh, this is going to be a big one. <laughs> and I was really fortunate. Um, he did donate $220,000 towards the project, so almost half. What's his name? Yeah, <laughs> he remains anonymous because he doesn't want people like you to call him up. <laughs> um, my husband worked at uh, Old Town Canoe at that time, so I got a, a kayak and all the equipment to raffle off. 
Um, I had eight pancake paddle ins. I went to Wyman Blueberries and I got a whole case donated of blueberries. And every Sunday we opened up for a paddle in to Burn Island for a pancake breakfast. So you see, I was creative. You see what I'm doing here, guys? All right. So Bernie, uh, he was at the Windjammer Emporium. And Bernie is a model. Like You have a nice model right there. You need to put a donation slot into it, OK? And that my Bernie was a lighthouse. And what happened is it had a bill acceptor. And every time a bill goes in, the light flashes. But if you put a big bill in, the foghorn blows, too. <laughs> So um, Bernie was bringing money in right and left because those children want to hear that foghorn going. Um, annual appeals, you know, four years before we knew that restoration was going to go. You got to send out letters to everybody. We sent people to all of the town offices to look at the tax maps to get everybody's address, and we sent out like five thousand letters to people uh, looking for donations and. Um, and so you, you maintain with those people who do donate, and then they usually donate year after year after year, and they're still very, um, very generous in that respect. Um, keep the light burning campaign. We had to get a catchy, you know, kind of uh, t uh, title for our fundraising, and that's what we used. And we even it, it involved children, and this one school really bit on, which was in Elliott, Maine, which is right down on the southern border. Um, they raised money for us all year long, and they turned over like $2,500 to us. Um, so I they had them out to Burn Island as well, so they could see what, what their donations were. A couple quick pictures. Here are the artists that were all. I said, okay, you got to kind of pose for me with the lighthouse there. So here's some of them here. Here's a pancake paddle in. Um, uh, flip pancake flipper that day, and he was on the board of directors. So now we have phase two, restoration. So Burn Island turned 200 years old in 2021. That was just a couple of years ago. So 2020, and it was COVID, so it was perfect timing because I was also responsible for the aquarium. So the aquarium wasn't open because of COVID. So we said, let's go, that's it. 2020 is the year, let's get this done. But you can see the condition of that lighthouse once um, the Coast Guard had what was called thorough seal on the outside of the lighthouse, which had to all be chipped off. And so what did I do? I went to the Coast Guard base. I said, your organization put this stuff on the tower. You need to come help take it off. And so they sent a crew of guys twice out to, with little hammers and chippers and they chipped all the thorough seal off. But look at the rubble stone at this point. Look at some of those, look at some of those uh, dips in there. You know, they're pretty deep. Um, as over time, rubble stone was rough cut granite that they got from the island, but they would just put in other little pieces of stone. It wasn't really closely fit granite. It was kind of haphazard, I think, but that was all kind of uh, filled in, and you can notice those wonderful decorator windows. They were all those window blocks, which was not period, believe me. Um, here's what the lantern room looked like. It was all rusted and pitted, um, and you can see the astragals, which are the, the framework that held the glass in place, all rusted up. Here's the actual tower that's uh, has all the scaffolding placed around it, and the young man below is repointing all that rubble stone. So an inch and a half of, of, of cement was removed from every single stone on that lighthouse. Um, they did find when they started to remove it that there was a gray Portland cement there so that there was a repointing that probably took place in the 30s and maybe the 40s. However, once they got a little deeper, it was the beige old lime, um, that was the mortar that was used at that period of time. But it lasted through those years, so I gotta give them credit. They must not have used water that was brackish water because that's why all of the lighthouses two through eight were rebuilt. Oh, we got plenty of water, yeah, it's salt water. It's not gonna last. And the, and the other um, problem with some of those lights too is that they built them too late in the year and it was too cold and the mortar just didn't set. So here I use a contractor, Jim Leslie, Leslie Contractors. He was a, a mason out of um, actually Elliott, Maine as well. He was in Southern Maine. Uh, the, the Maine Historic Preservation uh, Commission said he had done 21 lighthouses already in Maine. And so when I 
contacted him. He was really good and you know let us do some of the work that we cut the cost down where, wherever we could. Um, but he did come up and do all of the masonry work. So here you can see he's painting that hole. They, they blasted the whole metal framework and uh, he's putting you know certain types of sealers to try to rust inhibitors for the future. Um, here's the inside of the lighthouse. Those stairs were all rusted and some places needed to be repointed inside the brickwork, the brick liner inside of the tower. And then this was going on in the keeper's house. Everything was being stripped off, all the old siding, um, put on this really cool um, vapor kind of barrier now, but it also had these little bumps all in it to keep the clabbers to give an airflow instead of the mesh at one time. They used to put mesh underneath it, like a seat of breather, and now they have this new paper that actually has bumps all over it to do the same work. So here the guys are replacing windows. Um, the State Historic Preservation had to approve everything, and we went through all the steps. And some things, they give you a little flexibility, because those old windows that were there before, wooden windows, they don't last. I put some in the kitchen when we did the first restoration, and they were all rotted by the time I was doing the second restoration. So they let us put in Marvin windows. And I went to Marvin, and actually the representative was in, in uh, Ellsworth, um, and I brought them out to Vern Island and I said, come on, come out and see, I need Marvin windows. And I got them for cost. So it was a real deal and boy, are they beautiful windows. But part of it here is um, some windows, you have some pictures, but some you don't have. And borrowing keepers photographs and scanning them, Betsy Norton had a picture of her son sitting in that window in the tower. And there was my answer. That's exactly what that, how that window was built. And so the guys were able then to replicate that and put that same kind of framework in there. Here we go, we needed a new roof. This time we went with five quarter cedar shingles and they, and they were uh, yellow pine instead. Uh, yellow, yellow cedar? Yellow cedar maybe. Um, and so they were really, really thick. So that was a, a big job to take that all off and start, start anew. But what we didn't expect, because in any project with an old building, you don't expect all the rotten sills and under the covered walkway was all rotted. And so they removed every plank of the wooden floor and marked them with a number, stored them in the dining room, rebuilt the, the sill, and then they put the boards all back in place using them. The gentleman is one of the carpenters on the right, and he found a two cent piece fell out when he took off the siding, and it was 1868 two cent piece. And so then we had to say, oh, how did that get there? You know, so we had to make some assumptions on that one. But we also found a message from um, this gentleman. He says, uh, Thick Fog, Howard S. Haggett, May 9th, 1907, Arousic, Maine. So that one I could do a little something with. I called the Arousic Town Hall and I said, 19, 1907, do you know of a Howard Haggett? Oh yes, we know him. I said, what was his employ, what was he employed at? And I knew, I, I, I already thought I knew what it was and I was correct. He was a carpenter for the US Lighthouse Service. And so, but he lived there in Arousic. So it's kind of fun, these little, little pieces to the puzzle, you know? Here are the guys, uh, again, anything that could be reused that was historically correct on the buildings, um, here they they're taking all of the window trim and they're making sure it's sturdy and solid and replacing some of the pieces that might have been rotten. But I want to show you a beautiful sight. That's what she looks like today. That, my friends, is called a labor of love. And uh, it's just gorgeous now. So what's Bird Island used for besides being beautiful? <coughs> People come ashore. And so lots of kayakers, and you can see all the sailing activity in the background. It's a, Booth Bay Harbor is a busy place in the summertime. A lot of folks just want to come and have a picnic. And so we have picnic tables scattered all around the island to give them some little spots in order to enjoy the beauty and have their lunch. The recreation piece here is a, a couple that was just walking the rocks. Rocks are spectacular in Maine, and I know you said you had a geology person. I mean, 
I never liked rocks, but boy, once you can sit down with a geologist and learn about their formation, and it's incredible. Um, this tire swing was interesting because, you know, I used to ask all the former keepers, there were a few questions that, how did, who put that there, okay, until you finally found the one. And uh, so it, I think the best way for me was, you know, once you find a couple keepers, then you say, who was before you, who was after you, so that you get two more names, because the records aren't always available to you as exactly, and in the archives of Washington, the logbook stopped in 1936. Uh, so, um, 1939, when the Coast Guard took over, and then I couldn't find any records. And um, so that was helpful in getting them. So Randy Griffin is the keeper, and he was there in the 70s. And he went to the Coast Guard base in South Portland, and he found this hauser that came off from the uh, Coast Guard tug, the Yankton. And he said, you guys going to use this for anything? And they go, no. He goes, OK. So he brought it to Pern Island to make a swing for his kids. So it still hangs today. And that's his claim to fame. He just loves it, because he knows the kids are all on his swing, and it's still there. So public tours. So it was time to now, once the buildings were ready, it was time to let's do some tours. So let's get them out here. We did a living history program. So we brought children, we brought, brought uh, folks from town, and we brought some from away um, to be our interpreters. So we taught these kids, and the kids would steal the hearts of everybody. You know, these children were telling these stories. And in the first person, okay, they're immersed back to 1950. And uh, you see they're knitting, and they're kind of dressed in 1950 garb. But this was my gem. This was Jim Biot. Jim Biot was a former keeper on Bird Diamond, and he volunteered for three summers to play the role of Joseph Muse, and he lived the same life of Joseph because there was no electricity when Jim lived there. So he cranked those weights to spin the lens, he cranked the weights to make the bell tower work, and he was in his glory. I can't tell you how happy this man was. So here he is in bringing people up uh, into the lighthouse. And then one of our interpreters here, Mama, you can see she's outside with her, her wash tubs and her, her roller, you know, the, you know, some of you might remember those wash, how many people remember those wash tubs and use them, all right, see? Well, these little kids don't have a clue, all right? And they have so much fun being able to crank that crank and squeeze that out. Again, I, like, I mentioned to you, here was the, the muse girls who had come back to help those interpreters. <coughs> Here's mama and one of the daughters in the house, and they would have a script that they would go back and forth. But they were true stories. They were all the stories that the muse girls told us as what their life was like. Those muse girls even gave us back the belongings. Those paper dolls that little girl was playing belonged to Adele Muse when she lived there. Um, and the table and chairs, anything they still had, their dad's flashlight, um, a lamp, a lamp um, the high chair, the, anything they still had and that was on Burnt Island, they donated back to Burnt Island. Down at the boathouse, the peapod is on the on the slip, on the boat slip there. And the old wheelbarrow, the supplies just brought were brought to shore, the old cans and the you know, King Cole potato chip uh, container and whatever was 1950 classic of that time. So here the two girls were brought the public down. That you see the Nabisco crackers right there? All right. A tin of Nabisco crackers. And then one summer we were lucky to have a young man, no, two summers. Two summers, we had a young man who played Willard Muse, which was the son uh, of, that lived in town that I visited. So um, it was kind of funny because when I went to visit Willard, I was so excited. I was like, Willard, tell me what life was like at Burn Island. And I was like, I just can't wait to hear his stories. And he goes, I hated it there. <laughs> I said, Willard, he goes, I've been at five different island lighthouses, 25 miles out to sea at Mount Desert Rock. And he goes, here I come back to Burn Island. I, last station for his father was Burn Island. He goes, I can see civilization <laughs> right there. Um, and he didn't stay too long. He did leave. But we did portray Willis Willard as he hated it there. <laughs> So I started um, overnight trips for Burn Island, and it kind of started when my own children were in fifth grade because I loved their fifth grade teacher in Hamden. And um, so Sue O'Brien and I 
started to say, oh, let's do this fantastic field trip for the kids. And so we started with my son, Ben, which was actually the youngest. The other two didn't have that opportunity. We quite, weren't quite ready, but Ben was in fifth grade. So we started our first overnight, and we did these tents here um, in the field back there. And um, a, 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 just a funny story about Ben. Of course, he learned all the history through the years being with me, and I would always interview every keeper and one of my questions was did you ever see a ghost because all the houses are haunted come on you know they gotta be is prospect harbor haunted have anybody heard that yes okay so i read the log books in washington and i found that martha mccobb died in that house on march 22nd 1877 and also of Ben Stockbridge, I found a former keeper, well he actually was a Coast Guard and he was a relief keeper, and Ben, he brought Ben into the hospital, Ben died, but his spirit visited him on the way out. And so Reg Roy told me that whole story. So my son knew all these stories and Reg told me he was so scared and he was waiting for 11 o'clock to crank all those weights so he had six hours to sleep and he heard a scuffing sound coming down the covered walkway and old Ben used to drag a leg and here he comes. And so when Reg came to visit, he told me, he said he went the second time, he went to his car and he got his gun and he brought his gun back and he sat there and waited till that scuff was loud enough and he shot right down the covered walkway. So he was showing us the bullets in the wall, the holes in the wall. So my son, Ben, when all the little girls were there, you know, he'd bring the girls into the covered walkway and say, see these bullet holes? Old Ben, the ghost is here. <laughs> so um, he, the teacher said, Ben Jones, he said, she said, I'm going to take you off this island if you don't cut it out. <laughs> So her last parting wish to him that summer as we, he was leaving school was, Ben Jones, I hope you see a ghost this summer. <laughs> and the day we were unloading our stuff, the two oldest were old enough to go to work, so they kayaked to work. And when they complained, I said, you'll be able to tell your grandchildren someday you kayaked to work. And so Ben and I were hauling stuff. Well, you know, he was probably about 12, 10, 12 years old. He didn't last long, um, a couple of trips, and then I didn't see him anymore. And then he come running down the path, just a huffing and puffing. I said, what's the matter with you? The door slammed upstairs, and there aren't any windows open. <laughs> and Mrs. O'Brien got her wish, and he slept in a cot next to my bed for over a month. <laughs> All right, this tenting situation didn't always work. So I said, it's time. We need a building. We need an education center. And so I raised $320,000 to make this post and beam the education center. And it's in the form of a life-saving station, if any of you are familiar with life-saving stations. And so I went to Popham Beach life-saving. I went to, Honeywell, um, to Fletcher's Neck down in Biddeford Pool. And I looked at their life-saving station, Damaris Cove. So I could get the design right, and I could also get just the detail, you know, what kind of hinges, because I had custom-made, you know, doors made right there on site. And so I, I, got, it, I got it pretty, pretty well down. But when I presented it to the State Historic Preservation Officer, the SHPO, he said, you can't build it to look like that. I said, what do you mean? You know, I had everything perfect. Like it was the Popham Beach Life Saving Station. He goes, you're misrepresenting history. I went, ugh. All right, so what can I do? So we ended up no trim work that was beautiful, like some of those old stations, very plain and clabbered. All right, I'll take it, whatever. Because this is the inside and it's perfect. Um, I have the class, the major room there is the classroom space, but you can see we're eating our meals there or we eat outside on picnic tables. I repurposed all these booth bay. People are always <laughs> tearing apart kitchens. So I would go to carpenters and say, are you ripping apart any kitchens? And they, this one guy said, yeah, I've got all these cabinets. I said, I'll take them. And then we got to this part and they said, well, these are wine racks. And I said, well, we're not going to. Well, I'm going to put wine in there, but we use it for storage for, you know, uh, paper towels and things like that. Um, and look at those bunk beds upstairs. I have 32 beds and triple berths that these kids sleep in, like the, like the berths of a ship. And we, the teachers have to 
pick, the kids have to pick their beds and sometimes by a lottery system because if they get there, then there could be fights. So everybody knows which birth is theirs before they even get there. All right, lighthouse education. So of course we got to teach these kids about what it was like in 1950. So we have volunteers in town that put on the garb of the keeper, and here the gentleman is teaching them outside, and here the gentleman's up in the in the lantern room with the lens, and then you can see the kids. We have, and I, I noticed you guys have red with white, and we have two white sectors as well, which are navigational aids. They're like the fairways. If you follow the white beams, you're on course to Burnt Island. And I assume that's the same setup for you guys too. Um, so island life, let's put them to work um, and let's put them into period time. So look, they're mowing the lawn. They're doing the laundry, um, learning how life was like for chores on Bird Island. And then the household chores, they're using vintage tools. So here they're making rosehip jam and sifting flowers. You kids don't know what sifters are, or beating eggs, and we do all of these activities with the kids. But I do have to tell you the funniest part of the, the tour through is we have an old typewriter, you know, royal typewriter, right? And so when Mama was in there with the school children, and she says, do you type a letter and send it to your grandma? And the kids said, no, we use a computer. And she said, well, what's a computer? So the kids are trying to think, how are they going to tell this lady what a computer is? So one kid chimed in and says, well, we, we can type just like that with, letter, with number, letters and numbers. We can type. So we type, and then we hit the send button, and it goes up in the air and comes back down at Grandma's house. <laughs> and Mama says, what? <laughs> your computer goes up in the air and down at your grandma's house? Oh, no, 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 the computer doesn't do that. Well, then she said, are you crazy, you know? And she just tried to just play along with them, and it was hysterical. So edu lighthouse education is important, but the environment there, the, the island, the six-acre island, has every habitat you can imagine. And here's the rocky shore and the tide pool search. And so these kids are finding sea stars and sea urchins and all kinds of periwinkles and crabs, of course. But here's Walter. You know, there are sometimes a group of kids, um, there are some who are challenged, and Walter was a challenged child. But on Burn Island, he was king. He'd find everything. The learning, the experiential learning, hands-on learning, was Walter's uh, forte. And here he is with a baby lobster. He's the only one that found a baby lobster. After they find their finds, they go out with a little tub and they look for things and then they come back to me and uh, I have a blue tarp here that's all spread out with some seawater in it and they have to dump their finds into my tarp and then we have a lesson as to where did you find it, um, uh, what is it, you know, and, and how does it move, how does it adapt to the environment, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we try to put them back close to where we found them. We also have a compass hike, which is a lot of fun. They learn all these different um, different navigational tools, and the compass hike is one of them, which we incorporated into a treasure hunt, like a pirate treasure hunt, which we have a beautiful X rock where it's, the treasure chest is hidden. Here we had a flounder relay race, so these kids had to dress up as fishermen and run and boots and all of this, and she's got two flounder in her hands, and she's running to try to meet up with her, uh, her team to transfer the flounder. I also did a lot of summer courses with teachers because summertime is their time to do recertification and I even taught at the graduate level for courses for them. So they come from all around the state, they have that education center to live it, and you can see we're doing some activities there. Um, and I've remained friends with a lot of them and I still work with them as part of my nonprofit now. So this was my big finale, um, 2021. It's time to toss in my towel and also know that I have preserved this lighthouse for future generations, which is very heartwarming and um, uh, I'm obviously very proud of having accomplished that, but I didn't do it alone. I had lots of volunteers and lots of generous people and I thank them for that. So, in the ending, I wanted you to know that there is a report online. If you go to keepersofburntislandlight.com, 
Um, and scroll down, you gotta scroll down a, a ways because it's been a couple of years since this was posted. I'm gonna leave you with a copy of it, a hard copy of it, so that you can share it amongst yourself. But it's very um, detailed. I'm, I really hit every point historically, what materials were used for paint, what materials were used you know, in the restoration process. So I've got that all in here. So in case that anybody wants to restore a lighthouse, this is a document uh, that will help them get that job done. Any questions for me? <laughs>